This is it. This is the big reveal. I've been teasing this thing for what seems like months. This is the beginning of our Duramax Super Twin Turbo project. We've got a BDS 1071 roots blower on top of this 7 liter Duramax. It's breathing through some waggler heads that Jeremy was so kind as to give me for our dragster project. The guys at Comp did a really cool cam profile for this particular setup. I plan to turn it five to 6,000 RPM. We're gonna run it initially up to 5,000. I wanna see what the blower looks like in terms of parasitic uh, consumption off the crankshaft. I wanna see how much heat it makes into the engine in terms of compression heat from the blower itself. We're set up with two of our big ass L5P filters here and two of our four inch MAF sensors. So we can go to 120 pounds per minute of intake air. We're running two Bosch high pressure pumps at 80% of engine speed. So about 20% under crankshaft speed. And we're running the blower at 20% over crankshaft speed. So at 5,000 RPM engine, the blower will be turning 6,000 RPM. We've got a full-on dry sump system that I originally did for our road race GMC truck. Let's first fire this mother and see how much heat this blower makes. I'm real curious about its efficiency as a compressor. So let's go out in the control room and bark this mother. Everything looks happy. The data monsters are fired up. Let's see if this thing will light off. Gee, hard starting. <laughs> it's alive. Put a little heat in it here, and then we'll take a couple of pokes once we're happy. How's the oil pressure looking? Oil pressure is 58. Yes, All right, and we're using, uh, are we using a 2020 L5P oil cooler on this thing? I believe that's correct. Yeah, this is cool. This is probably an LMM or LML based cylinder block. And we're using a 2020 L5P engine oil cooler and running the dry sump oil through it to uh, cool it. So that's. That's a different thing there, but I want the engine to be self-sufficient. We'll see if this oil cooler is big enough. I'd rather have one mounted on the engine uh, than one remote in the vehicle. So this is kind of exciting because there's a whole lot here that's never happened before. And I don't know of anybody that's really documented running a blower uh, on an L5P or a Cummins or a Ford, any of them. It certainly looks badass in the dyno room. Let's start the data logging and let's make a let's make a poll and see how things look. All right, we're warm. We've got coolant flow, the thermostats are open. Let's bring it up to 3200 and see what we've got. Just no load. In other words, no dyno load. Just bring it to 3200. And the only thing we're powering here is the supercharger itself. Now the dyno wants some minimum horsepower just to run itself at, at each speed point. So here we come to 3200. The blower sure sounds good. All right. So the, the dyno minimum is around 90 horsepower right now. The temperature going into the blower, measured by the air mouse, is 94 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature coming out of the blower is 296 degrees. This is at 3200 RPM, and we're making 11.8 pounds of boost. 
This isn't real promising. Uh, <laughs> Whoa, it's almost 300 degrees. It is over 300. It's kind of normalizing now. It's heating the blower up. Well, let's go ahead. We'll run 1,000 RPM to 5,000 RPM. We'll get the boost at each point, and we'll get the blower temperature increase at each point. I don't have high hopes for this. All right, we've made all the other pulls. This is 5,000 RPM. Let's go for it. I'm keeping an eye on the compressor discharge temperature here and the boost. Here it comes. All right, 4,000. 330 degrees. 350, 5,000 RPM, 18 pounds of boost. We're coming up. I don't like this. We're, we're almost to 400 degrees. Let's get the hell out of here. I've had enough. All right, let's let's stop the data logger. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give I want this. I want the data. There's an old saying in poker, read them and weep. That's what's going to happen here. I don't think this is going to be good, good news on the temperature front. Oh my God, this does not look good. Before we get into this data, let me take you out to this shop and let's talk superchargers. I got my start uh, in the mid 50s. And back then, a guy named Stu Hilborn had done fuel injection and a lot of guys were also finding the GMC superchargers off of the most popular being the 671 GMC inline six engine that had a supercharger hanging on the side of it that looked very much like this. In fact, we have a 50s vintage top fuel engine, which I call the drafting room engine. This thing lived in the drafting room for years. It has on it a 671 that's totally vintage. It's taken off of a GMC engine, a 671 two-stroke, and the supercharger was there not to actually supercharge the hell out of the engine. It was there so you could tar start the two-stroke. It pushed air in for the starting purpose. I saw my racing buddy, Bruce Geisler. We pitted together at Bonneville and both ran Studebakers, and he started getting into supercharging. I had done my first supercharged engine about 1961. I did a blown Buick nail head in an R&R &R ski boat, a wood ski boat. That was my first taste of supercharging, but I really couldn't afford to do it for my own. So I had Hillborn, my Hill, Hillborn injected small block Chevy in my Studebaker, but Geisler had a blown small block Chevy and he had a t-shirt. And on the t-shirt, and I think he was gigging me, it said, I'd rather be blown than injected. I totally agreed with him because any guy building engines, the guy who wins, when everything else is equal, same cubic inches, same maximum RPM, the guy who gets the highest air density can put in the most fuel at the correct air fuel ratio and make the most power. The highest density in cylinder always wins. As long as the engine will go along with the gag in terms of the power output. I've done a lot of engines where the supercharger provides great throttle response. But ultimately, they're parasitic. They eat power from the crankshaft to run them, sometimes hundreds of horsepower. So I've tried to do this super turbo thing where I could match a turbocharger to the mid-range and the top end power output and use the supercharger for the low end and throttle response off a turn or out of the hole. I've always used screw blowers. They're great, they're really cool, but I've never used the old GMC design, the old roots blower, and I'm kinda curious about them because they move massive quantities of air. And if I'm going to blow a couple of turbos into one of these, uh, I, I kind of want the opportunity to help the blower a bit. In other words, I want to experiment with what I call blower push. 
the boost from the turbochargers starts to overwhelm the blower's capacity and literally push the, the lobes, the rotors in the blower, and kind of unloading the parasitic from the crankshaft and the belt drive. But a few years ago, a friend of mine, Mike Ryan, was running his Size Matters Freightliner semi up Pikes Peak, fastest truck on the mountain. It was compound turbocharged, but kind of soggy off the turns, lots of smoke. And I was up there, we were running our, our twin turbo 440 inch alcohol Chevy project with Paul Dallebach Racing. And two years in a row, that scooter was the quickest car on the mountain. But I saw the second year up there with Dallenbach, I saw this semi and I watched it run and I watched the smoke off the turns and I went, that's horsepower in the air. That fuel went into the engine and never got used. It just got roasted and kicked out as little mini briquettes, which is the smoke. That's horsepower. If that was used in the engine, boy, he'd be ripping off the turns. So I approached him, I says, Listen, man, I'd love to do a super turbo with you. Had a 14 liter Detroit 60 series in it. And I kind of went, let's do something together. So we got together, we built a super turbo Detroit 60 series. We upped the RPM from, I think it was 2300 originally, 2700 RPM. And we made 200 horsepower per liter, which is 2800 horsepower. came off the turns, wrinkling the tires, literally. It was the quickest truck ever to run on the mountain. And I don't think anybody's gone any quicker with a semi. It is the fastest semi ever to run, Pikes Peak. That super turbo worked beautifully. It was a big screw blower, a big whipple, pushing into Kong, and this giant turbocharger, through a hell of a lot of charge air cooling. We used our water meth systems here and there, and we used one of our water meth systems to fog distilled water across the face of the charge air cooler. At higher altitudes, you need a little, the air is kind of thin, you need a little help to cool all that boost air. So we've chosen now on this project, the Roots Supercharger. Back in the mid 1850s, the Roots Brothers, I think they were in Cornersville, Indiana, were working on a, a water motor, a, kind of a two lobes that interacted with each other, high pressure water came in, turned the rotors and exhausted. They wanted to run a little plant that was a nearby canal and uh, th they wanted horsepower to run machinery in the plant. The wood thing kind of, the wood rotors kind of expanded, they swelled up, jammed the thing. So they pulled it out, they dried it out. And one of the brothers walked up to the thing and to, to see if it was dry enough to spin again, he spun the rotors and he blew his brother's hat off. And they kind of looked at each other and went, wait a minute, this thing can blow air. So they ended up manufacturing roots, blowers for blast furnaces. If you've ever seen a blower for a fireplace, the old things that you squeeze and it puts a jet of hot air and you're trying to get the fire going in your fireplace. You don't see much of them anymore, but they were quite common a hundred years ago when I was a kid. And it's the same sort of thing. There's not a lot of pressure involved. It's a lot of air mass. These things are roots blowers. Not one of them actually came on a GMC engine, but we all call them GMC blowers. All three of these are 871s. The blower on our top fuel motor from the late 50s is a 671. They just get longer, the rotors get longer. 
the inlet and outlet, and these are the conventional very early bolt patterns and inlets and outlets. There's lots of science that, that's been applied to the shape of the outlets, especially down through the years. But these are conventional. I want to start with this. The one on the engine and the dyno is actually larger than these three. It's a 1071. What I wanted to show you is how these work. I've never been able to read any data on how much horsepower these things require to drive them or how efficient they are at compressing air because they were never designed to be air compressors. They're just mass movers of air at very little pressure increase. I want to go to 15, 20, 25 pounds of pressure. How well will they do that? That's the question. If I'm happy with it in the dyno, then we're going to turn around and put two turbos on there, blow them into the blower, but no one's ever measured the efficiency. We're going to do that when we go back in the cell. How does one of these work? These are three lobes. The original, uh, I've seen two lobe, and I know there's been four lobes. What they do is the air goes in the top, and I'm, I'm facing the front of the blower, the, the drive end. Uh, this is the drive end here. You'll notice there's some gears in there. The input shaft goes in here ro and rotates this gear, which rotates the other gear and the other rotor. So if we turn these, you'll see that the rotors are turning such that they mesh on the bottom, come up and open up and capture air and take it around the outsides. The air does not go through the center. Actually, a little bit of air comes back up from the outlet side in the gap between these rotors. They don't do it all at once. They're not straight lined. There's been some hot rod blowers through the years where the rotors are straight and you get pulses of air that are just brutal. Not to mention the shock load on the belt drive. The belts just do a dance. By making kind of a helix, uh, it's a gradual meshing and unmeshing. So it's easier on the drive and it doesn't, doesn't put the air out in pulses into the engine. What does it look like on the bottom? We're, we're inducing into the top, the air flows in, is captured in the grooves between the lobes and taken around the outside of the case. So here we are, we're on the bottom. Same direction, you can see the gaps coming through, watch those fingers, Gail, and they mesh together here, going back up towards the top. So the air is discharged, except for a little that's captured in the clearance between the lobes as they go back up. I'm going to be real inter interested in whether or not that increases the air temperature in the blower hat. As a discharge temperature comes up, how much of that air gets b back into the hat and preheats some of the air going in, which will also be really lousy for the compressor efficiency. The whole idea here is you don't want to heat the air at all. If you heat the air, you're not getting as much density, as much pounds per cubic foot of discharge air. Traditionally, these things are not run dry. The guys generally have a couple of four barrel carburetors on top, uh, or if it's a top alcohol car, they've got a, a hat injecting boku amounts of methanol into it. So you really can't get an efficiency number because the methanol is evaporating, cooling the compressed air before it even comes back out. So gasoline too serves to cool. I want to know the truth about these things because I want to use that cooling effect somewhere else. I don't want to waste it all here just to make this thing look good. So these are the things that a lot of guys, the older guys consider, like me, consider it badass. They sound badass. The belt drive looks badass. They're tall on the engine, you know, and then you get the injector hat and all of this thing happening up in the air, are they really as badass as they look? 
or are they 1850s technology being run 160 years later, 170 years later, right? Do I have that right? 1850, 1950, another 70 years, 2020? Huh? These mothers are old. <laughs> Let's go find out what the hell the truth is. All right, I've got the data. Let's have a look at where we're at. We've kind of graphed it up so, so you, we can all share this. Graph number one, boost air pressure. What did that 1071 do on that engine? Well, we reached a little over 18 pounds of boost at 5,000 engine RPM. Remember, this blower is running 20% overdrive and it's a 1071. So if we've got 127% increase in pressure, which it is 18 pounds represents, will this produce 127% more horsepower? A lot of people think there's this direct linkage between what percent you increase the boost and how much more horsepower you make. In other words, if you have 15 pounds of boost, you've basically doubled ambient pressure. So, a lot of guys think, oh, that'll double the horsepower. Let's see what's going on here. I think we need to look, though, at the temperature because that scared the hell out of me. So this graph's showing you boost air temperature, and this is horrific. I've never seen anything like this because I've never run one of these blowers dry. Uh, at 5,000 RPM, our boost air temperature was 423 degrees in the intake manifold. That'll sure as hell warm up your oatmeal in the morning. 330 degrees of that was added by the supercharger. Okay, we're moving to the third graph, and this one is labeled 1071 blower compressor efficiency. This is kind of an eye opener. If a supercharger of any kind is 100% efficient, it's still adding heat to the air. Why is that? Because you can't compress those air molecules together without building a little excitement between the molecules and consequently some heat. Let's call that natural heat of compression. If we go to this, to 18 pounds of boost, the natural heat of compression is 147 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's represented by the blue line, and that's the 100% compressor efficiency line. If a compressor only did that, it would be 100% efficient. I've never seen that happen, and we probably never will. That area is represented by diagonal red lines, but our roots, it turns out, is 48% efficiency. Any temperature gain above the 100% efficiency point, I call a measurement of compressor inefficiency. And that's the cross-hatched red area, and the heat being generated is the red line at the top of that cross-hatch. Instead of 147 de degree gain, which is 73% over ambient in its own right, we now have a 330 degree temperature gain, or 288% over ambient. This is not a good place to be because this kills the hell out of any air density you're going to get at these boost levels. Moving to graph number four, this is boost air density. This is why we supercharge. We don't supercharge to get a boost pressure number. We sure as hell don't supercharge to increase the air temperature adversely. We supercharge to make every cubic foot the engine displaces through the cylinders have a greater amount of oxygen. So how much did we gain here? Well, the ambient air density was 69 pounds per thousand cubic feet. The boost air density with this 1071 at 5,000 RPM rose to 98 pounds per thousand. So we have a gain of 29 pounds per thousand cubic feet. Well, we started at 69. Hmm, I think we need to go to the next graph. So what I wanted to do on graph number five is compare boost versus boost air density. Remember, the boost air pressure, the red line here, shows that we've got a 127% pressure gain. Well, what's our density gain? 
Here we are, we've got a 29 pounds per thousand, or a 42% density gain. This supercharger is not looking too good to me here. 127% pressure gain for a 42% air density gain. This is, this is kind of where the wheels are starting to come off, or at least the bearings are getting hot. Let's go to number six, 1071 blower pressure ratio versus density ratio. The red line on the bottom is the 48% blower efficiency. And what we're looking at is the density ratio or the pressure ratio above ambient. We've got a 1.42 density ratio for the blower. Compressor out was 423 degrees. The manifold air density reached 97.8 pounds per thousand. That's a 1071 at 48% efficiency. If we were to run a 75% efficient turbocharger, our density ratio, this being the blue line, at 5,000 RPM would be a 1.64. So we're multiplying ambient density by 1.64. The compressor out temperature would drop from 423 degrees to 307 with a turbocharger. Mind you, there's no intercooling here yet. We're just looking at what the blower would do and what, what a turbocharger would do with the same 2.27 pressure ratio, which is the top red line. Okay, guys, this is the Readem and Weep chart, chart seven here. Uh, this is what I was talking about when I pulled the micro SD card out of the data monster a few minutes ago. With the 1071 at 48% efficiency, and what we're measuring is air mass flow, and then I'm gonna mix some fuel with it and estimate an engine efficiency, that is the pounds of fuel used to make one horsepower for an hour, uh, that would be typical of both these setups, and predict some horsepower numbers. I think this is going to be really close. So we're, we're going to make the comparison at 5,000 RPM. And you'll notice I've got some vertical lettering here. This is 18 pounds of boost air pressure. And the engine is displacing 628 CFM. Looking at the mass flow, and this is actually measured 63 pounds per minute for the, the roots blower. If we were to run an engine with that air mass at 18 to 1 air fuel ratio, and assuming we're burning 0.55 pounds of fuel per horsepower hour, our horsepower would be 382 horsepower. We're at 18 pounds of boost on a 427 diesel, and we're making 382 horsepower with this gargantuan supercharger. I'm not too excited at this point. In fact, I feel like I opened the gift and there was nothing inside. Let's look at a turbocharger under the same circumstances. 75% compressor efficiency. Now here, we don't have a blower drive. We don't have this parasitic supercharger using some fuel just to run itself. We're not going to use as much fuel mass per horsepower hour. We're at 73 pounds per minute mass airflow. So the mass airflow is up, same boost, 18 to 1 air fuel ratio, 4 tenths of a pound per horsepower hour. And you can do this. It's a typical thing with a diesel. 608 horsepower. So the difference in the mass airflow is 16%. But the difference in the horsepower is 59%. What did we change? Same boost we changed from a belt-driven, parasitic, pre-Civil War <laughs> blower idea to a current state-of-the-art 75% efficient turbocharger. From 16% mass flow increase, we got almost a 60% horsepower increase because the blower parasitic isn't there anymore. The thing of uses a whole lot of fuel and a whole lot of horsepower out of the crank. It's robbing horsepower out of the crank at a felony level to run itself. Here's the deal. I want to run the roots blower for throttle response purposes. 
But if we're going to make this thing work and push two turbos in, into the blower, we got to go defeat the heat. I don't want to kill this supercharger, and I think I will if I continue to run it dry. So rather than have a sudden death experience for this BDS 1071 billet blower, I better do something to cool this thing down. You see these things right here? We'll talk about that next time. So next episode, I'm going to hammer down and you don't want to miss it. All you need to do is subscribe.